Hi, my name is Jonathan Bootle, and today I'm going to tell you about our work on linear time arguments with sublinear verification from Tensor Codes, which is joint work with Alessandro Chiesa and Jan Skorp. Now, in the setting of efficient arguments, a prover wants to convince a verifier that a statement is true, for example, that an N gate circuit over some finite field F is satisfiable. And ideally, the prover should convince the verifier sending only a polylogarithmic number of bits. And neither the prover nor the verifier should do more than a linear amount of work in the size of the circuit. Now, we can hope for even better verification time if we introduce an indexer who does a one-time pre-processing of the circuit so that the verifier doesn't have to read the circuit. And then we can aim for polylogarithmic verification time. But of course, we still want the pre-processing done by the indexer to cost no more than a linear amount of time in the size of the circuit. Many existing argument systems use fast Fourier transforms or algebraic commitments. And this is an obstacle to achieving the dream that we outlined above, because if you use a fast Fourier transform on a polynomial of degree O of n, then it costs O of n log n field operations. On the other hand, if you use algebraic commitments, such as the Pedersen commitment scheme, which requires O of n group exponentiations and appears to be a linear time operation, well, Actually, on closer inspection, you'll see that uh, the number of field operations that you have to do to compute a multi-exponentiation depends on the size of the group. So this isn't really a linear cost at all. Lots of exciting existing works which achieve excellent concrete efficiency actually fail to achieve the linear time goal outlined above because they either use uh, fast Fourier transforms or algebraic commitments. And many of these works have eliminated the fast Fourier transform from their cryptographic arguments, but they still use algebraic commitments and still incur a linear number of group exponentiations. In order to achieve this holy grail, we'll need to drop the the, the use of algebraic commitments and fast Fourier transforms completely. There is one cryptographic argument which was published in 2017 that does manage to achieve um, a linear time prover and indexer complexity um, and has a sublinear verification complexity and proof size. That's a square root in the size of the circuit. And that work is based on an interactive oracle proof with similar parameters. Um, and once they've designed this information theoretic interactive oracle proof, they note that you can compile it into a real cryptographic argument using a special hash function, which itself only incurs a constant computational overhead in the number of bits that you want to hash. So our challenge is to see if we can do better and reach our, um, our holy grail by constructing linear time IOPs with better query complexity. And here are the results of our work. In this work, our main theorem is that for any epsilon um, and for any fi finite field with sufficiently many elements, we show that there's a point query IOP, which has a linear indexer complexity and a linear prover complexity, and then a sublinear verifier complexity and sublinear query complexity. By using the linear time hash function uh, and the same strategy as this 2017 work, um, we show that there is a corresponding linear time argument with very similar parameters.
our work is an interactive oracle proof. So I'm just going to briefly explain what that means. In the interactive oracle proof model, a prover will send proof oracles to a verifier who doesn't read the entire proof oracle, but just has query access to each proof oracle. Um, the prover and the verifier can interact. Uh, the verifier can send back challenge messages to the prover who can respond with more proof oracles over several rounds of interaction. And we can design interactive oracle proofs with different types of queries. For example, there are point queries, which return one location of a proof oracle. And our main result is going to be a point query IOP. There are also linear queries in which the verifier asks for a linear combination of elements in the proof oracle. And finally, there are tensor queries in which the verifier asks for a specially structured linear combination of elements in the proof oracle, where the linear combination has to be a tensor product of two different vectors. Our approach to proving the main theorem is actually not to directly construct a point query IOP, but to start by designing a linear time tensor query IOP, and then using a compiler which takes the tensor query IOP and a linear error correcting code and produces our point query IOP to prove our main theorem. In more detail, we start by showing that there's a tensor query IOP, which has a linear prover time, a linear indexer time, sublinear verification time, and a constant number of queries. And then using the code base compiler, um, we convert this into the, the IOP for our main theorem. Now, note here that the tensor IOP had a constant number of queries, whereas the, the point query IOP in our main theorem actually has a sublinear query complexity. And in some sense, this is the cost of converting from tensor queries, uh, which are very powerful, more powerful than point queries, into uh, point queries um, for which you can only see uh, a single location. Now, um, if you look at the, the parameters for the, um, the inputs and output of the, the point query IOP that we produce, uh, they're very closely related. Um, in particular, the, the output point query IOP has index approver and verifier complexity, which depend on the complexity of the prover, indexer, and verifier from the input IOP, plus some additional overheads related to the encoding time of the error correcting code. And in particular, if we use a linear time encodable code C, then our code base compiler actually preserves the complexity of the prover and the indexer. And so if we use a linear time tensor query IOP as input, then the output is a linear time point query IOP. Our work's related to lots of different techniques uh, in the field of probabilistic proofs. Um, for example, uh, the various linear time interactive proofs, which have been published over the past, um, over the past 12 years or so. Um, holographic arguments, some of which have been published very recently, studying how the preprocessing can work, and code-based IOPs, um, which act as compilers or give interesting um, IOPs of proximity. Now I'm going to say a few words about the techniques used in our code-based compiler. The first input to the code-based compiler is the tensor query IOP, in which the prover sends their proof oracles and the verifier can make tensor queries to those proof oracles. In the compiled point query IOP, we start off with a simulation phase, which follows the same pattern as the tensor query IOP, except that instead of sending tensor IOP proof oracles, the prover sends encodings of those tensor IOP proof oracles to which the verifier can make point queries. And 
because the verifier isn't allowed to make tensor queries anymore, they send their tensor queries directly to the prover who computes the tensor query answers for themselves and sends those answers back to the verifier. This seems like it could be a problem because it, now we're trusting that the prover correctly computes the answers to each tensor query and sends the correct answers to the verifier. In fact, we're even trusting the prover to come up with valid encodings of tensor IOP proof oracles in the first place. So after the simulation phase, we introduce a tensor query consistency phase in which the prover and verifier conduct a proximity test, which checks whether the prover really sent encoded proof oracles and a consistency test, which shows that the prover's tensor query answers must be consistent with the encoded proof oracles. This boils down to designing an efficient IOP of proximity um, to handle tasks one and two. Now, we want to be able to preserve the linear time property of an input tensor query IOP. And so we have to choose our encoding scheme very carefully to make sure that it not only preserves linear time of the underlying tensor IOP, but we have to be sure that the encoding scheme will admit efficient proximity and consistency tests. We choose tensor encodings. More precisely, we take a linear code, C, which doesn't need to have any special properties at all, and we encode the tensor IOP proof messages using the tensor code C to the power T. If C is a linear time encodable code, such as a Spielmann code or a Druckerschrei code, then the tensor code is also linear time encodable. So how does our consistency test work? Somehow we have to find a connection between tensor query answers and encodings of some piece of tensor IOP proof data. Of course, these are supposed to be connected by some tensor IOP proof oracle, which has been encoded to get the tensor code word and queried to get the tensor query answer. So first, let's focus on how tensor queries can be computed from the tensor IOP proof oracles. Now first, I'll talk about a folding operation, which is really simple. If we have a collection of different tensors or matrices or arrays A1, A2, and A3, and a vector V1, V2, and V3, then the folding operation simply takes the linear combination of the A's using the V's. And using this folding operation, we can describe the computation of a tensor IOP query answer sequentially by folding the three-dimensional tensor, um, tensor proof data that you can see at the start of this slide, um, first with one component of the tensor query, Q3, to get something two-dimensional, then with Q2, and then with Q1, and this procedure actually gives you the tensor query answer in the end. So the tensor IOP proof oracle is connected to the tensor query answer by this sequential folding operation. Now, what about the tensor encodings? How can they be computed from the tensor IOP proof oracle? Now, by definition of the tensor encoding, we can actually consider the tensor encoding as a sequential computation too, where we encode different dimensions of this piece of tensor IOP proof data separately. So we could encode horizontally first, for example, um, and then vertically to get our final tensor code word. In order to perform the consistency check, we fill in an extra piece of this diagram, the green rectangle that you can see. And 
this is an encoding of a piece of TensorIP proof data that's already been partially folded up. Or alternatively, if you like, it's a folding of some TensorIP proof data that's only been partially encoded. And the idea behind our consistency test is that we check consistency diagonally. So at every step, we, we have something which has been partially folded up and less and less encoded compared with the original tensor code word. And we want to check consistency between all of these intermediate values. In the actual IOP of proximity that we design, we make use of the fact that the folding operation and partial encodings can commute with one another. And so we check consistency between these inter intermediate values by encoding one and folding the other and checking that the two answers are equal to one another. At least this is the basis of the verification checks. In the actual consistency check, IOP of proximity, uh, the prover will send all of these intermediate values on the diagonal to the verifier. And now what the verifier wants to check is the collision between these encoding and folding operations. They want to check that those two values are equal, but this has to be done using just a small number of queries. So instead of reading the entire uh, array in every case, the verifier makes spot checks using only a few queries. They just query these stripes of uh, each of the arrays. And then the distance properties of the code C guarantee that any inconsistencies in the computation of the tensor query answer are caught by the verifier. Now, if we use Spielmann codes or Drukishai codes, which are encodable in linear time, then since the original tensor query IOP had a linear amount of proof data and the codes are linear time encodable, all the steps at the top cost a linear amount of time for encoding, um, as well as for this folding operation. Now, after the first folding step, the prover is only dealing with, um, with proof data which has a sublinear size, and so the encoding and folding operations associated with the, the bottom part of the consistency test are sublinear. As for the proof size and the verifier complexity, the verifier only ever queries these one-dimensional stripes of each array. So for the running example on the board, uh, this leads to a query complexity and a verify complexity of O of n cubed. Now, of course, everything I've shown you generalizes to t dimensions and to a proof size and verify complexity of O of n to the power one over t in that case. Now I'd like to conclude the talk by giving a summary of the approach used to prove our main theorem and describing once more our main results. In our paper, we show that given any tensor IOP and any linear code, we can use our code-based compiler to convert the tensor IOP into a point query IOP. And then given any collision resistant hash function, we can compile the point query IOP into a cryptographic argument, which has sublinear proof size. Now, if we instantiate the tensor IOP with our own linear time tensor IOP, and we take linear time encodable codes, such as the codes of Spielmann or Drukishai as inputs to our code base compiler. And finally, if we take linear time computable hash functions, then what we get in the end is a linear time computable cryptographic argument with sublinear proof size. Thank you very much for listening.